Hello, and welcome to the Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast, episode 44, East Meets West. From Hamilton, Ontario, I'm Sean, and here with me, live and direct from Windsor, Ontario, the Tabletop Bellhop himself, Mo T. I am the Tabletop Bellhop, your cardboard concierge, answering your game and game night questions and striving to make everyone's gaming experience better. Let me put my years of game playing, event organizing, and game night hosting to use for you. I'd like to say hi to everyone in the lobby here on Twitch. We start here live every Wednesday night at 9.30 p.m. Eastern at twitch.tv slash tabletopbellhop and continue on even after the double bell ends the show for more Off the Books After Show. Now, for those of you who aren't here live, if you want to hear the audio from those after the show chats, as well as our start of the show banter, all you've got to do is back our Patreon at the $4 level or higher. You also get some other cool stuff like access to our private Discord channel and pre-production show notes. Now, this week, we're going to be looking and def- looking at and defining some common board game terms. Uh, Euro game or Euro or German game or German game, Euro, Germany, whatever. There's a million different terms. Or the opposite side of that, the Ameritrash, Amerithrash, American style games. Now, after the main topic, I'm going to be talking about Teo Tawakin, Strasbourg, and sharing some thoughts on Zaya. Work is coming on strong here for me, and compared, combined with my son getting my old Pokemon Sapphire <laughs> game, I'm sticking with board game arena stuff mostly. I'm going to have to note that one down. Ter- Teldern in our chat is noting that he heard a new term, Eurojank. That one, I don't know. That sounds, I don't know. Dirty, I, not, it's not a surprising term. I haven't heard it, but it, yeah, it makes sense. Like, I, obviously, the Ameritrash, Euro Trash. I've heard Euro Trash for years. One of my favorite songs is titled Euro Trash. <laughs> but anyway, those two sides. That's what we're going to get to. We love interacting with you, our listeners and viewers. Each week, we're going to highlight some of our interactions with you fine folk. We'll share some of the feedback we receive, comments on our content, and maybe some of the gaming discussions we've been part of through the past week. We want to share what people are saying, whether that's positive or negative. We get better with your comments and suggestions, and if you'd like to let us know something about the show, send your feedback to mo at tabletopbellhop.com and or sean at tabletopbellhop.com. That's S-E-A-N. Uh, you can also hit us up on social media, where we can be found everywhere as Tabletop Bellhop, one word. So I mentioned this a couple weeks ago that we're going to start doing a weekly poll. And I want to start off with that poll. So this topic goes back to last week. And I asked, Tabletop Gaming Awards, do you pay any attention to them? I also asked people to comment to let me know why they answered how they did. Well, the results are in and 48% of you say yes, while 52% of you say no which doesn't really seem all that surprising to me, at least. I think a lot of it has to do with how much of a game buyer you are. Uh, For me, I would expect people who buy more games to be more likely to pay attention to help shape their purchasing in the coming years. Yeah, that makes sense, actually. I I hadn't thought of that. Because when I first saw that number, my first thought was, wow, that seems low. I, I don't know if I'm stuck in my own little alpha gamer bubble where most of the people I talk to do. Um... Like, because personally, I think awards are great in the, and have quite a bit of merit. Uh, the two big things for me are pointing out games I may not have heard of. But the biggest one is really narrowing down my focus, because as we've talked about many times on the show now, there are way too many games getting released every year. Like we're talking tens, like uh, tens of thousands. We're almost at tens getting of thousands. there. Almost. We're, we're getting really close. Like I th- it was over 8,000 games released at Essen last year. So by this year, it's probably tens of thousands. It's just crazy, right? There's just too many. You can't pay attention to all of them. So I find things like awards are something to give me focus and narrow down separating the wheat from the chaff. Now, the one thing that surprised me even more though, were the number of comments from people that didn't know that there were awards and tabletop gaming uh specific people who commented don jordan beard nikki blair peterson were just a few people who basically did a today i learned from my post saying wow i didn't know there were awards till you mentioned them in this poll well yeah i think it's really just sort of something people don't think about as there isn't an industry that's out there that doesn't have some form of awards but if you're not paying attention you can easily miss it Now, here are some specific comments in regards to awards that we thought were worth noting. Matthew Franz, at Matt Franz 2212, said, They used to matter, 
But now watching people play, review, and getting to demo are more important. It's like the Oscars. Most of the time, the winners or nominees are not what I think is the best movie. Thanks, Matthew. Like, to me, awards are just another source. They're, they're another source of info, right? To me, it's just something to throw in with those actual plays and those reviews and all that. To me, it's just another source. UK Gamer SI, at UK Gamer SI, I only really follow the SDJ. That's the Spiel des Jahres we were talking about last week, as most of the nominees are good family games. The awards based on that require publishers to supply, sorry, the awards based that require publishers to supply copies are by definition choice limited. The public voted awards follow the latest hype Kickstarter and not gameplay quality. Well, thanks, UK Gamer. Now, Richard Jackson at Papa, at Papa Jackson says, awards make me think about a game I may have overlooked or dismissed, such as Carpe Diem. Is it really that good? I will seek out opinions and thoughts of reviewers to get different perspectives on nominations to see if they're really worth picking up. Yeah, that's pretty much what I said last week. I'm pretty much on the same boat as Richard here. Purple Phoenix Games, at Purple PHX Games, commented, I don't really follow awards a lot, but I do pay attention to them. Just helps keep me informed of what's going on. I won't avoid games if they haven't won, won awards, though. Awards or lack thereof don't dictate my gaming preferences. Well, thanks for the comment, Purple Phoenix. Flat Out Games, at Flat Out Games, says, Knowing context and who is judging them is important. What is interesting about them is they give us a bit of a window into what different people or groups value in game design throughout time and what is seen as innovative, novel, or good design. Thanks, Flat Out Games. Now, to add to this, another aspect I find interesting is when the different awards for the same year pick completely different games. Like, while it's great when you see one game that wins all the time and it's probably worth checking out, I always find it more interesting when every single group picks a different winner. It makes me wonder why. Finally, Nate Parker at Gameosophist wrote, I don't, at least not anymore. There are so many games these days that one can easily miss one deserving an award. You're better off judging by other means, reviews, trusted sources, etc., and coming to your own conclusions. Thanks, Nate. And that's at Games Sophist. I don't know. But uh, up next, a couple of comments for Rocky Mountain Navy. Uh, from Rocky Mountain Navy. These were left on a couple of our kids' games-related blog posts. Up first on raising the next generation of gamers. In our house, we have long cut the cable and only had streaming. At the same time, we set limits for kids' TV viewing. In return, we have had plenty of other activities like building models and toys, puzzles, and games. Lots of games. These days, kids have their own shelf of games and hobbies, games for family guests or in living room, while wife tutors ESL kids in preschool and early ele elementary, so those age-appropriate games are handy. We usually see that many parents only know mass-market games, but embrace hobby games for their better quality and enhanced enjoyment. Our kids have become gaming ambassadors for the neighborhood and led other families to gaming through their kids. Young students take to gaming very naturally as long as the skill-appropriate game is used. Now, what a fantastic comment. I'm really impressed by that. Now, I am glad that I'm not the only one whose kids have their own game shelf, so it's not just me. Uh, for a while around the holidays, my kids even had their own pile of shame, but we did manage to get through that. Uh, what I love uh, is the fact that Rocky Mountain has been converting parents into hobby games, and even better, that their kids our neighborhood gaming ambassadors. I love that. Uh, we don't have a lot of kids in our neighborhood, but my girls do like to bring games to school and share them with their friends. Now, Rocky Mountain Navy also commented on my Some of the Best Kids Games Out There blog post, which was about competitive kids games. Um, they wrote, Wow, our kids game collection overlaps by nearly half. Wife tutors ESL kids, and she often uses games as a way to reward, motivate learning, especially in preschool and early elementary. Even as kids get older, our kids become gaming gateway ambassadors to other families. Well, thanks for both those comments. Jumping back to our tile laying games where you build something game suggestions, Keith Davies write, Dice Settlers is a 4X style game combining tile placement and dice bag filling? I don't know the right term. You gather dice through play and change what you can roll over time. Anyway, the land is built of hex tiles you place as you explore. Well, thanks, Keith. That sounds rather good. 
I'm going to have to see if anyone local owns a copy. It's not one I plan on rushing out to buy, but it does sound like one I want to try. Now, I also want to thank Keith for a comment he left on our Valeria Card Kingdoms playthrough video on YouTube that just went live this past week. In it, he broke down all of the die probabilities. And I got to admit, I was personally surprised to learn that the 910 citizen is going to get hit more often than a 7 citizen. Now, I'm not going to read off the post here, as most of it is math and probabilities. But if you check out that video, you can see the comment down below it where Keith breaks it all down. Thanks, everyone, for the game suggestions and comments. We record the show live Wednesday nights at 9.30 Eastern on Twitch, and we encourage people to drop in and take part in our chat room, the lobby. Don't forget, if you're here live, we continue the show after the double bell in an off-the-books after show, as well as some special features that might make it onto YouTube. Tonight, we've got, and she games, uh, Dragon Gem, Mage Akela, and Teldurn all chatting. They've been talking about a uh, local Buffalo game called uh, Blizzard of 77, huh. uh, which, uh, which actually sounds rather interesting. It's almost a shame that it's uh, sort of a local-only uh, game. So it's a game you can only get locally, or is it just the setting was that local? Well, the that? setting was based off local, and I think it was just distributed locally uh, for people who got hit with that uh, <laughs> New York and Pennsylvania blizzard in 77. I wonder if we can expect a Windsor flood of 1999 or 19, 2019 anytime <laughs> soon. So I don't know anymore. You don't want to live here unless you're on the hill. So tonight we've got a gaming term question. Uh, I'm going to define what I think a Euro game is and what I think an Amerithrash game is. Now, I, I was torn on what to ask the chat room tonight. Like, part of me, I just want to know, what do you prefer, Euro or American? But on the other hand, I really kind of want to know what you think of those two terms. Like, do you think of them as derogatory? Do you use them? Uh, basically, at this point, I'm going to leave it up to you guys in the chat. So you folk in the chat, feel free to take it however you want. We'll be back checking in with the chat room throughout the show. We're here to answer your game, gaming, or game night questions. You can send your questions to questions at tabletopbellhop.com or head over to the tabletopbellhop.com website and click on Ask the Bellhop. Social media works too. We're everywhere as tabletop bellhop, one word. Well, the best way is for questions come through the website. They don't get lost in the mess of things scrolling by. I'm not going to say no to a question asked anywhere. Today's question comes from Mike Murphy, who writes, what's the difference between a Euro game and an American game? I see reviews where they describe a game as a Euro type game. What are they referring to? Well, thanks for the question, Mike. Now, Mike is actually part of my personal game group. Uh, a couple weeks back, we sat down to play Strasbourg. And at some point, I noticed noted that, wow, this is a dry theme. It's, it's a theme pasted on Euro. And he's like, whoa, wait a minute. You use that term all the time. And I keep meaning to ask you, and I always forget, what the heck do you mean when you say that? Now, my other friend, Sean, Sean Hamilton, not Sean from Hamilton, pointed out that Mike's been meaning to send in a question to the podcast. We talk about it often on Monday nights before we game. How's the podcast going? How many followers you got? Stuff like that. And Sean's like, hey, there's a question. Send that in. So right there, Mike's like grabbed his phone. He's like, all right, how do I send you a question? He went to the website and he sent in this question. And I got to say, I think it's a really good one. Uh, we kind of alluded last week to we were going to be talking about this week. I, I think this is a well worth talking about. Yeah, I'm actually looking forward to this talk because while I think I know the difference intuitively, uh, I can look at a game and say, yeah, it's Euro. Um, it's not something I feel like I've ever been good, worked at explaining. So I'm yeah. hoping to get something out of this too. Well, I'll see what I can do. So just a bit of background to this. The one thing that I've noticed pretty much since I was a kid and I was a nerd and beat up for it is the geeks, nerds, whatever you want to call people who enjoy games like this, like to classify things. They like to put things into boxes and this extends to their hobbies. Go to any game store. You're likely to overhear. Uh, if it happens to be a bunch of people role playing, what's the difference between a story game and a role playing game? Or you're going to hear the whole gameist narrativist uh, story. I think that's a GNS thing. Uh, you're also probably going to likely hear an argument about who would win a fight between the Hulk and Superman. Uh, go to a board game forum. You're going to find people arguing about what's a mass market game or what's an indie game, what's a hobby game, and so on. The whole German game, Euro game, Ameritrash argument is just another part of this. 
Now, while these specific terms may be fairly new, uh, like based on the research I could find, it looks like Ameritrash was coined in the year 2000 on Usenet. This debate is probably as old as board gaming ever was. I'm sure at some point there was some general with an, arguing with another general about how Go is not a real game and chess is much better. Oh, uh, and Teldrin points out simulationist is the, uh, the yeah, yes that's word. Yes, I knew there was an S. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. So I have to say, and, and maybe it's the geek in me, but to me, definitions matter. It's really difficult to talk about something if not everyone is certain they're talking about the same thing. Uh, imagine, ima imagine trying to expound the benefits of a widget, which to me is a life-saving medical device. But you've always used widget to mean the little pads that press against your nose on glasses. It would be a confusing discussion. So in that, you know, it, it helps to, to define terms and, and make sure everyone's talking about the same thing. Now, one of the problems is that this argument has gone on for a long time and many different people have different opinions and the entire thing's a little messy and blurry. So even though we have some definitions, everyone's definition's different. So as Sean just pointed out, maybe they don't mean exactly the same thing. Now, the other problem, and this is, in my opinion, I, not a problem, it's actually a good thing, is that the game industry itself has evolved significantly since the year 2000 and when these definitions came out. Uh, Euro games were these weird new things coming off the boat from Europe, and that's why we called them Euro games. Well, nowadays, everyone plays these games. They're the the. The terms, at least to me, feel old, dated, and in many cases don't even apply. Despite that, though, people continue to use them, and I admit I do it too when I don't catch myself. I try to avoid using these terms, but sometimes they slip out because I'm used to using them probably for the last 19 to 20 years, if not longer. Um, so since I received a question asking for specific definitions from a fellow gamer, I figured I would do the best to explain what I think a Euro is versus an American game. Um, now, it is worth noting that Euro game doesn't necessarily mean from Europe, and American game doesn't necessarily mean from America. Yes, that's the origins of the terms, but like some of the most famous Euro games come from Sid Saxon, who's an American designer who made the game Acquire. So just to show it, and some of the most Ameritrash games I own are made by a company from the UK called Games Workshop. So it's not a geographic thing. It's You can have a Euro-style game that was made in North America and a Games Workshop-style game that was made in the UK that is very much Ameritrash-style. Yeah, while Euro games may have emerged from Europe, this is a world economy now, and let's face it, most of it's all made in China anyway. Yeah, it's true. They, they, most of these are China games, which is probably very much true, though I think the term China game probably, it more probably deals not, with that bootleg yeah, copy of Splendor you got off <laughs> Amazon. So here's what I think when I hear the term Euro or Euro game or German game. I've been gaming for a long time, and the way my brain works is that I hear it and I immediately think of a bunch of games like it just I don't even think of why those games It just I think of a bunch of games. Now, of course, Euro Euro game is derived from German game at first, like back in the 2000s, people called them German games. And that's because these games were coming out of Germany. Uh, we talked about this during our gaming awards podcast episode last week. Germany is pretty much responsible for what we now know as hobby board gaming. It was these new games with new mechanics and a different look at player interaction that changed the gaming industry the world over. So we can go back actually all the way to 1960s when 3M put out a uh, set of bookshelf games, yep. uh, which, which again, much uh, like everything else, looked very different. These were leather bound bookshelf games that contrasted very starkly to the, you know, Box long, that you, thin box. you know, the long thin box that the family games were coming out in uh, in uh, in America. And that was sort of the the beginnings back in the 1960s of the uh, the Euro versus American difference. So these are the features introduced by these games from Germany and the features that I still think to this day classify a Euro game. So up first is little to no player elimination and or player interaction. These games are about doing something abstract and scoring points and trying to get more points than anyone else and score points better than anyone else. 
They're about building some form of engine and they reward playing efficiently. So it's all about efficiency engines. While there may be player interaction, it's usually indirect. So you're not attacking someone, you're not stealing their stuff. It's more indirect through trading, setting market prices, positions on the map, or possibly taking a spot so they can't take it. There's usually no direct conflict and attacking each other is almost unheard of. A lot of people will use the term group solitaire uh, for a lot of Euro games. And this comes from the fact that uh, in the post-war era, uh, Germany was really trying to avoid a warfare standing. They mm -hmm. they were really, you know, fighting against that uh, that idea and, and vision that a lot of the world had of Germany. And so conflict and warfare wasn't something they were going to promote. And it wasn't something they wanted to, you know, have at the table or after dinner. Uh, yeah. So they they went away and they found other ways to uh, to, you know, have that competition without the direct conflict. Yeah. Group solitaire or multiplayer solitaire. I hear that one a lot too. Multiplayer solitaire, which in many cases is true. There are some games that are purely who can do the thing better. Which is a strong part of it. Uh, second, I've got a focus on mechanics over theme. When you have a game where the theme doesn't matter at all, where you could literally strip it off and completely change it, you're probably looking at a Euro game. Uh, one example of this, I'm not going to give a lot of examples in the middle of this, is we went to Origins and we sat down at a Mayfair booth and the game on display was supposedly about making chocolate. The guy teaching the game thought it would be hilarious to instead tell us the game was about making toilets. And it worked. The theme mattered that little because the entire game could have been about any six step process, whatever that happened to be. We could have been a game about photosynthesizing as a flower or something. It was that bad. When that happens, you're pretty much looking at a Euro. European games are often developed mechanics first. The designer comes up with this cool new system like, oh, I have this awesome way of moving cubes on hexes to go through six different steps. And you can only move your cubes if they're in the right place. Like they come up with that and then they decide on a theme. Even more so, it's often the publisher who decides on the theme of the game and not the designer. Designers I know have pitched games to companies and the company's like, well, that's great, but right now, sci-fi's hot. So we're gonna take this game, we're gonna throw out your theme and instead you're building rocket ships. Um, Terraforming Mars, from what I understand, is part of that. They jumped on the Mars theme because of how popular Mars was with the Curiosity rover thing was happening at that time. You're often going to hear people say pasted on themes or themeless. Um, and some have no theme at all and are literally abstract games where you are just moving cubes. If you look at a lot of like tack the beautiful game or uh, there's many of. Them. Yeah, it's it's pretty easy if you can see if you step back, uh, you know, it's hard to it's hard to do with a game you love necessarily. But a lot of games you, you, you just sit back and look at them and watch from a distance, watch people playing. You can see that they're just moving something around mm -hmm. and, and what the pretty colors or pictures are don't mean anything. Um, or, or are, or are extraneous to the game. Yeah. Uh, number three, low randomness and, or a way to mitigate any randomness. Now, while you will find dice in cards in many Euro style games, they're not used frequently and they're not used for the same things you find them in American style games. Cause when they are used, there's usually a way to mitigate the random factor, like a way to reroll the die or change it to another side. Um, there's also something I'm not going to get into the game theory here, but there's a difference between input randomness and output randomness. Most of the Euro games are input randomness as opposed to output randomness. So you're going to roll the die and based on what you rolled, you're going to choose what to do. But instead of I choose what to do and roll a die to see if it works. That's, that's a really simplified version of those two types of randomness. Um, most Euro games contain open information. Like you can look at the board state and you know where everyone is. Now, some of that might require memorization, what players did on previous turns, but you have that information. It's all there. There's no guessing. <clears throat> and often when there are random dice or whatever, you're going to know the exact odds. So, you know, when you're playing Settlers of Catan, you're using a 2d6 bell curve. There's a reason the robber steals resources on a seven. That's because seven is the most common number on 2d6. 
There's a reason, and, and the game shows you this. On the little chits you put out on the board of Catan, there's dots on there to show you how often those numbers are going to come up for people who don't know the bell curve off the top of my head. The focus in Euro games is on players making decisions with a lot of information up front. The design focus is that the winner is determined by skill and not luck. Uh, one of the things about a Euro game is the randomness is often the other players. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's that's the, the, the form of randomness to use. Rather than having a dice, the fact that you have no idea what tactic or uh, theme or, or, or way of playing that your opponents might use is the random factor. Uh, so that they don't need dice. Very true. Yeah, I've definitely heard that one before, too. I don't remember what number I'm on. This is four, I think. The next Doesn't one. really matter. It's the next one. Uh, you play yourself. You're you in the game. Like, you're not abstracted. Um, you're not playing a role or a character. You're not a fighter. You're not a warrior. You're definitely nothing named. Like, in Gloomhaven, I had to name my character, right? I was a Savas Crycart. No, in, in general, like, the theme may say you're, like, a ruler of a country or head of a merchant guild or leader of a household of merchants. It's all means nothing when it comes to the actual gameplay you're making all decisions as a player for your faction we'll call it whatever that faction may be now in some cases that faction may be a collection of cubes and others you may have workers under you but you never really feel like you're the head of a household you're just someone building an engine you're just going to use the resources given to you to score the most points as efficiently as possible yeah, and this is part of the theme list. Like there, there is a lot of uh, sort of if you read all the the background text for some of these games that you are the you know missionary for the emperor going mm -hmm. out to you know f make your people happy. But it's it's literally it's just that it's just a, yeah. a pasted on theme. Very true. And Dragon Gem in the chat is asking if deck building games are Euro games. Most definitely. Now, some of the more modern ones kind of mesh things, but at least Dominion, you could retheme Dominion to whatever the heck you want. And what are you playing in Dominion? What are you? What are you? You're doing, you're building something. You're just trying to use your gold cards to get point cards eventually. Yes, they supposedly are called provinces or whatever. Now, before so now, we move, before we move on, though, one other one other detail that uh, that does tend to uh, sort of designate a Euro game less so now, but in, historically, at least, is the designer is the author. Um, no one really cares no who team. no one. No one cares who makes life the game of life or Monopoly or things like that. Whereas, you know, we all know who Stefan Feld is. And, yes. and you know, the designer is a major factor. Uh, and in fact, Euro games are often called in some areas designer games because yep. of the fact that the designer is so important to the to the theme and the, of the game. Yeah, it's, it's similar to that. Obviously, I do research before I talk about all this stuff. One of the interesting ones I found that Board Game Geek defined a Euro game as is the designer's name is on the cover. Yes, it's which a common me meant nothing about the game, so I wasn't yeah. going to bring that up. I'm like, yeah, it doesn't really. It's it's a it's a very stuff. common definition though. The designer game as a Euro game. Yeah. You see that more and more, but like to be honest, like Fantasy Flight Games, no one knows that Corey Knizia is the one who made Star Wars Imperial Assault. Right. Like no one knows that. Oh, I, OK, some people do obviously <laughs> or I wouldn't be saying it, but it's definitely not common knowledge. Right. Like and people generally assume the other thing, too, is that American games are often built by teams because, again, we're going to get to this in a minute, but it's a theme thing. Right. It's we're going to write a Star Wars game and let's get a bunch of people together to write a Star Wars game. Yeah. So before I get ahead of myself, um, here's some of what I think are the features of American style games. Number one, which I already kind of alluded to, is they're dripping with theme. Like in those games, you're not scoring points. You're running to escape the zombies. Or you're a space marine on a derelict spaceship trying to survive the alien onslaught. Uh, your party's trying to sneak into the dungeon and steal the treasure without waking the dragon. Or the players are private eyes in the future competing to see who can solve a murder first, right? All of these are games I own, and they're all about the theme. Most American style games, story is way more important than individual mechanics. They're much more about the experience of playing the game than they are about the final score. Yeah, absolutely. You get into uh, a lot of things like, I mean, games like Clue, uh, yeah. <laughs> you know, not really necessarily a good game, but because it's so dripping with theme, 
Uh, it, it has been a, a classic for, for so long because yes. the theme brings people in, even though the mechanics may be, you know, good or bad. I do like the deduction aspect of Clue. Just take all the other stuff out. Yeah. But... <laughs> Which I'm sure many people have tried to do in other games. Yep. All right, next, because I'm not going to count this time. Direct conflict is common. Many Ameritrash games are about beating your opponents, like literally winning over the other players, not getting the best you can do. It's about beating the opponents down. Uh, direct conflict, where you're destroying, capturing, stealing resources are common. Uh, many of these games have sides where you're either opposing teams or you're playing your own factions aside against everyone else, right? Think risk or your teams together where you're one team against another team. Um, sometimes those teams are one player versus the other. They call these one versus many games uh, where these are almost like role playing games where one of the players controls like multiple enemies, right? Um, take that mechanics are very common as our backstabbing. You're going to find games where the actual goal isn't to win. It's to prevent the other players from winning. Yeah, I think we can all uh, sort of understand why Risk wouldn't yep. have come out of Germany. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> to jump back to your earlier comment yeah. on why the <laughs> games are the way they are. Yeah. Uh, complete opposite to Euro games. In an American game, most often players play some form of character or role. Um I already kind of alluded to this when I talked about it, right? Uh, like you're trying to run from a zombie. You are trying to run from the zombies. Um, you're playing a specific character or team of characters, uh, whether it's a squad or a party or individual characters. These characters usually have names and backgrounds and personalities. Uh, while role-playing is not at all required to play most of these games, it's often encouraged and sometimes encouraged highly. Uh, other RPG elements like leveling up and collecting better gear and finding equipment and improving your character are also very common in American games. Now, this is one thing that I think is sort of how the American uh, gaming industry developed. Um, a lot of the American gaming industry is based off of product licenses. Mm -hmm. So... And when you've got a product license, nothing is better than making sure that you'll, those people who buy that game are completely involved in that game. You don't want to have, you don't want to pilot a bunch of people flying towards the, you know, Death Star. You want to be Luke Skywalker in the X-Wing flying to the Death Star. Uh, and so that immersion comes with, uh, you know, playing in that game. Uh, whereas if you're just doing an economic challenge there's no real role to play i also think there's probably more psychological to that or cultural is I, north america in general seems to be way more it's about me whereas most of europe seems to be it's way more it's about us now i'm generalizing and i'm talking off the top of my head here i have no degree in any of this <laughs> stuff but it just as especially i gotta say americans america just seems to be much more about playing the squad the team being awesome being all that you can be well, there's, there, I mean, European Europe has a generally more socialist bent, right. which is is sort of that uh, that you know one for all, all for one uh, thing versus the individualist um, yes. goals of America. Whereas you can become great Anything, in America, right? the American yeah. dream. You yeah. can you can be whatever you want to be. Up next, randomness is embraced. Give me dice, please, as many dice as I can. Let me roll dice. They are a very big feature in many American-style games. Roll to move, roll to spot, roll to hit, roll to resist damage. So many dice rolls. Now, sometimes the game uses cards or tiles or chits pilled from a bag, but random elements are very common. One of the things and features, I would say, of American games is that you never know what's going to happen and you can't always predict and play ahead tactics are rewarded over strategy now the difference between tactics and strategy is something we should probably talk on the show it's not a full topic but tactics is reacting to what's happening now so you're reacting whereas strategy is planning ahead six turns right that's the difference between you american games tend to be tactical they have you you're reacting to what the other players are doing and part of that is the random elements. It's impossible to plan six turns ahead when you don't know what die rolls are going to come up or what tiles are going to come up or what cards are going to flip over. Now, what the randomness element does 
that's very positive, and it adds an element of surprise, as well as re- increasing replayability. If you never know what's happening, no two games are going to play the same, which is a big draw, where some Euro games, uh, Puerto Rico, a lot of people out there think that game is scripted, that there is a proper way to play and a proper opening, and if you don't play that way, you're playing it wrong. You don't get that with American games. Well, I, I get that. I do a little bit have a problem with that simply because of statistics, whereas your game is going to trend towards a specific uh, way of playing uh, yeah. based on dice. Uh, and then you get the real American games with, uh, you get your things like Dice Capades, which 133 different dice in it. Uh, <laughs> uh, there's actually there's actually a couple of threads on Board Game Geek which talk about, you know, what games have the most dice wow. and over like 100 to 150 um, there are a number of games out there where, where it's uh, it's there. You really do have over a hundred dice yeah. in uh, in your game. Well, that's where cards beat out dice, where you don't have that bell curve. As yeah. soon as you're not adding dice up, then it is it's more random, right? You have a one in fifty two chance of drawing all the cards. You're not going to get aces more often than you get twos. So that's kind of my way of looking at it but really i gotta say a lot of this to me nowadays and i don't know if just because i've heard the terms for years falls under you know what when you see it which i think is just because i've been hearing over the years these are euro games and here's a list of euro games and here's an american game and hearing the debate that i almost think the best way to know what a euro game is compared to a american style game is just to list a bunch of them right like here if you play this kind of game like you're, i think by i'm gonna go give you a list of i think it's 10 of each type and by that, you should be able to go, well, is it closer to that list or this list? And you should be able to make a difference. So I'm going to provide a quick list of games under each category. Uh, these happen to be games I personally like. So I went with, uh, you know, not these aren't a top 10 or anything like that. I didn't get into that much detail, but these are examples of Euro games I really enjoy. So number one has to be Catan, right? It is the quintessential German game. It's the one that changed the world. Yep, there's dice in it. So there is some random factor, but overall, all your player, it's it's a race to 10 points. Your player interaction is about trading with each other. Well, you can cut someone off by building a road, but it's as Sean noted earlier, that's a random element added by player moves. It's not something on the board. And well, yes, and- but... Yeah, and while while the nineteen sixties uh, sort of may have may have been the first appearance of Euro games, uh, it's pretty well regarded that the first uh, introduction to the world of yeah. of the hobby game Euro game style was Catan. Was Catan. I mean, it's yeah. it's the it's the original one that actually made its mark uh, yes. internationally. So any other ones, I'm not going to talk about all these in detail. If anyone has any questions on any of these games, I'm happy to talk about them during the after show or hit me up on social media. Uh, But it's Puerto Rico, uh, Carcassonne, El Grande, uh, for a little more epic and a little more modern, Terra Mystica, uh, the world's most renowned Steffen Feld game, The Castles of Burgundy, Concordia. Oh, I love Concordia. Uh, we just talked about the last couple of weeks, Brass, uh, in particular the Lancashire, but both Birmingham and Lancashire uh, for auction based key flower. And then for one that uses dice, but it is no way an American game. It's all about that dice mitigation and using the numbers that input randomness is Troya or Troya, T-R-O-Y-E-S. I've heard it pronounced both ways. Uh, so Sagrada, where does that fall? Sagrada would be a Euro game. Because the tools let you modify your dice rolls. Right. Yes, there's dice. Again, that's the whole thing. And, and we could debate it. But, yeah. but that's definitely on the Euro side. That's what I should say. I should say it's, it leans towards the Euro side. There's something I didn't put in when I wrote this up in the blog post. And there's something I'm, I'm jumping ahead. This should be in our finale. But in fact, it's a scale. It's not a yes and no. There's going to be games that fall on the scale, different parts. It were much like the weight scale we talked about a couple of yeah. weeks ago. Uh, it, it is a it is an American Euro scale. Yes, which it, it, that's, that's actually a better conclusion than I came to when I first thought of this. So once we get to the end, we could repeat it or we basically said it now. <laughs> so moving to the other side of the scale, uh, one of the games I've been talking about a lot and I'm going to talk about it later in the show is Zaya Legends of a Drift System. That's all about the randomness, and you will not enjoy that game if you are a hardcore Euro fan, because you have to embrace that randomness. You have to realize 
that there's a fairly good chance you're going to blow up multiple times during that game. And it doesn't matter because there's no player elimination. So at least they took that element of American games out of it. But there is also a direct conflict as well because oh, yeah. you can go and just beat on other players. Oh, yeah. It's got almost everything. Yeah. You play a character. You are your ship. You could name it if you want. It's got all of the American elements in there. It, yeah. it, you Lots of dice, roll and move. Uh, it's, it tells a story. You can you can explain how the galaxy was formed and expanded out. You even play NPCs. You level up. You buy new modules for your ship. It's a lot of the stuff I talked about above. So similar, I'm not going to get into details of all these games. So just going on, so some classic Space Hulk, one of my... Oh, I love that game. That That's probably the Ameritrash game I embraced the most for its its crazy randomness playing a squad of dudes. And then Talisman. Talisman technically came before Space Hulk, but it's got a couple Euro elements, but roll and move right there. The guy who gets to the middle wins. Come on. Blood Bowl. So, okay, I got to get away from the Games Workshop. Uh, Imperial Assault, we mentioned earlier. Fantasy Flight game. It's Star Wars. It's a battle game. You got Zombicide. I mentioned running away from zombies. There's that game. Mansions of Madness is one of those one versus many games set in the Cthulhu setting. Uh, throw on a kid's game on the list, King of Tokyo. Though I got to say, it's actually an improvement on an older American game. It took Yahtzee and gave it a bit of a theme. But it's still pure dice rolling luck. And the theme is monsters beating each other up and you play a character. Uh, survive. This is one where you're trying to escape a desert island. Again, all about the story. And screwing the other players over, because that's what Survive's really about, is moving that Kraken to eat those little swimming people. Uh, and the last one I got on my list is Arcadia Quest, which uh, Tom Vassell called Looney Tunes the board game. Uh, it's an adventure game that looks like it's a co-op, but it's actually all about beating the other team to the end of the quest with little uh, shibi looking fantasy guys. <clears throat> So some final thoughts on these somewhat dated board game terms. Uh, th that, those are my personal thoughts on the difference between so-called Euro games and Ameritrash games. Um, while these definitions are still somewhat useful for differentiating between different styles, nowadays, I got to say, they seem less and less useful. Like gone are the days when a game is either all theme and all abstracted or it's all mechanics. Like... We have plenty of games nowadays that manage to do both. Uh, we came up, we mentioned it earlier. Sean mentioned it. It's, it's a scale. Uh, just as an example, just to give one, a modern example, Clank, a deck building adventure, to me is the perfect example of a Euro game that takes the theme from, like, really, it's a retheme of Games Workshop's Dungeon Quest. And it combines that with the deck building of Dominion. So you have one of the most Ameritrash games, Dungeon Quest, and a very solid Euro and mesh them together. And you have a game that's deeply thematic, but still has most of the trappings of a Euro game. Yeah, it's we're at a point now where, aside from your uh, Milton Bradley games, you're going to have a hard time finding a game where you can't point out a Euro feature and an American feature and, and a number of each. Uh, you know, yes, there are still Milton Bradley games out there. And one of the things you'll find a lot of times is, again, as I was mentioning earlier, those license games, uh, because mm -hmm. th those tend to be in a very, a very Americentric concept um, of, of, of licensing a product and, and what that brings when you when you license the product mm -hmm. tends to be that immersion theme randomness so that it's not, you know, you don't want it, you know, you don't want it, a story game where you're just playing through the movie exactly or, you know, the, the TV show mm -hmm. or whatever. You want that random aspect so that you do feel like you're involved in that world. Um, and that's, again, one of the big uh, American themes. But aside from that, you're and even in the, a lot of those now you're going to get more euro features because they make for fun gameplay yeah so the one thing i do have to put out there these are my opinions obviously uh i think i know what i'm talking about but you probably think i'm wrong so be sure to hit me up on social media hit me at mo at tabletopbellhop.com and tell me how i completely screwed up this topic because i do know this is a heated one and people have their own personal definitions so i do think i gave it a pretty good shot uh, one other thing I, I, you didn't mention, I'm just sort of uh, glancing over at the Wikipedia definition because they've actually done a pretty well rounded uh, concept of Euro game is uh, the international audience. So you don't get word games in a Euro game mm -hmm. um, because they, they try to avoid outside of the rule books 
uh, any use of words or right. uh, or a sort of localization. Yeah, the lang language independent games. That's a, that's a good point. That's a good one. There, uh, Queen Games is the best example of that because any Queen game you buy, you get like eight rule books. Like, remember when I opened up Shogun? And I'm like, yeah, okay, we got to get all the other language rule books out of the way. That's a, that's a good way to look at it. I hadn't thought of that. And I, yeah, I got to admit, like, Fantasy Flight Games, you wanted to play Imperial Assault, you, someone would have to translate that entire game. Whereas yeah. Catan, just the cards, nah, eh, Catan's got the cards. So you, you'd put in a different deck of um, whatever they're called improvement cards development cards that's the term all right so let's take a trip back to the lobby and see what people down by the red carpet have to say about that's not what we're talking about this week but uh <laughs> i caught most of it there we say go about america games and i, I did know elder uh noted that both terms seem derogatory yeah, I gotta say, Ameritrash, like the Ameritrash, Amerithrash. Yeah, I mean, a thrash or a trash, I, I, it doesn't I really matter. I prefer to use Ameritrash. I, I grew up in the '80s. I'm all about the thrash metal, so I, to me, that's a positive thing. But I know lots of people that think trash, thrash is trash. So yep. I totally get that too. Uh, to me, Euro game doesn't seem that derogatory, which I don't mind using Euro. Like when I when I think of games, to me, that is a definition. It means it it means all the things I said Euro means. Yep. The other thing, too, is it's important. I should have mentioned this in the main topic is neither of these terms make the game better than the other. I don't personally think Euro games are better than Ameritrash games, whatever you want to call them. Like it, I, there is. Uh, um, There's a place a trend, for both. A meme, a meme <laughs> out there that designer games are better. Or you're a better person because you play designer games. And I'm sorry, that's just not true. Uh, you aren't a better person. You could enjoy Munchkin and Monopoly and play Candyland all you want. That doesn't make me better than you or you better than me. We just like different kinds of games. So in this case, I, I don't think of any as better. I will say people probably all have a scale on what they like. I personally lean towards the Euro side but then I love some Ameritrash games. Like I said the Space Hulk, right? Like that that super random, I'm hoping to roll a six to hit that gene stealer. Like you don't get that from Euro games. So I dig that. I, I still like Talisman, even after, even after all these years and the fact that it takes six hours to play, I still like it. Azaya being the perfect example of a modern game that I just played last week that I you have to embrace the randomness. So I I, I fluctuate, right? Zaya, uh, for me, uh, Blood Bowl. Um, I don't get yep. to play it uh, on the table. I play it digitally nowadays. But, uh, you know, Blood Bowl and, and Zaya are both great games. I love them. Uh, but, you know, so is Shogun. <laughs> and yep. you're not going to get much more Euro than Shogun. Yeah, uh, Euro, you got the <laughs> random factor of that cube tower. But again, this is, what, this is what I was trying to get across with the, the open information, right? In Shogun, if you're paying enough attention, you know exactly how many cubes are in that tower. Yep. And you don't necessarily know the odds they're going to fall out, but like that's part of the game is being able to go, huh, I think there's three units left in there or seeing them in the base of the tower. Like I was totally going to attack you, but there's four red cubes down there now. Yep. Maybe I better not do that. So yeah, I saw, I saw, uh, tell Durham, what else we have in the chat? We did have a question about deck building. I personally think deck building is a Euro game mechanic. Yep. Um, Dragon there's specific mechanics that are definitely, Euro games. So uh, worker placement is a big thing. Started with Kalis. Kalis being the most famous. And there's another game where you don't get much more. Uh, and then there's Ameritrash games that are very much um, uh, mechanics. Ameritrash mechanics. And the most obvious one is one that every role player knows off by heart, and that's roll to hit. That is very much uh, an Ameritrash mechanic. You'll notice many modern RPGs are trying to get the Euro feel to it by making it so that um, you have output randomness. So you roll first and determine what you do, right? Apocalypse World approaches that somewhat. So in Apocalypse World, you don't say I hit the goblin. It's I swing my sword at the goblin. Then you roll the dice and then you narrate what happened. That's output randomness, right? So that's a change even in that field. Uh, Teldurn's asking where I would place Broadsword. Uh, it's... It's more Ameritrash than anything else. Uh, there's You're playing characters, you're leveling up, you're exploring dungeons. I didn't see a lot of Euro mechanics in it. I will admit I've never played. I apologize. I read through the rules, but it was a really early version of the rules. <laughs> and again, that's a conflict thing too as well, right? Remember you're, when, you're, when you're dealing with conflict, you're 
You're yeah, definitely it's, it's, in the it's, more it's, American it's, it's, side. Right? It's players versus the DM. Yep. Most most RPGs are actually very Ameritrash, Ameritrash. But that's where America. they started, right? They, they're they based off of war games. They grew from war games. They yep. show their Ameritrash, Thrash, whatever roots. Like I said, I try not to use that term. I, the Ameritrash term, I throw it. I will, I'll keep using Euro probably. I should start saying, I don't know, strategy game. I... I designer game whatever yeah i mean designer game is is while inoffensive it's also kind of less useful to, i find to me, it's offensive to like the cory knizia's of the world who don't have their name on boxes I, right like I, yeah i think hobby a hobby is probably the least offensive and and way well, you hobby game, but that, to you me, know. that means both yeah well that's the thing right it's, i mean it's hobby versus mass market are your yeah your two uh, to be honest, like there are two other categories, right? We're talking personally, I think mass market's a completely different category. Uh, I also think abstract, right? Your chess, your go, whatever, those are their own thing. And then there's something in war games. Chip based war games aren't really either. They're right. their own thing. I could probably rank each one on this scale, but to me, war games are a completely different right. type of mechanics. All right, moving on, if unless we have anything else from the chat. Mm. I've lost my show notes. There, there. <laughs> so that's it for this week's Ask the Bellhop. If you'd like to read about gaming and game night topics like this, be sure to check out the blog at tabletopbellhop.com and click on Gaming Advice, where you'll see plenty of topics answered in blog form. If you got a question for us, head over to the website, click on Ask the Bellhop, or send an email to questions at tabletopbellhop.com. We keep growing with the support of fans like you, so if you haven't yet, please take a minute to subscribe, like, rate, review, click on the bell, thumbs up, share to your friends, wherever, and however you find us, you can help us grow. Sign up to receive Tabletop Bellhop Weekly in your inbox. Once a week, I'll be sending out an email recapping all the content we released the week previous. Blog posts, new podcast episodes, reviews, previews, unboxings, whatever else we create. Uh, you can sign up at newsletter.tabletopbellhop.com or go over to the tabletopbellhop.com web, web page and you'll find a spot to subscribe in the sidebar. Our Origins is coming up quick, really quick, like two weeks, three weeks, two weeks. I don't know, soon, way too soon. Uh, if you're a publisher, you're a game publisher, RPG, board game, doesn't matter. You're going to be at Origins, you've got a booth and you want me to stop by your booth, hit me up on social media, please. Let me know your booth number. Give me a time to stop in. My, my schedule is pretty open. I'm getting quite a few people sending me emails already. Uh, if you've got something you want me to check out and talk about online, please hit me up. Mo at tabletopbellhop.com and I'll be sure to fit you in. Now, over the last couple of weeks, I've had a bunch of packages show up. Um, I've shown them off during our week in review and part of the after show. And I actually like a little small pile of them over here next to my desk. So yesterday, I actually took some time to open all of those and record some unboxing videos. Those of you who follow us on Twitch should have seen the go live notifications yesterday as most streamed each of these unboxing videos. And it was a nice distraction from the absolutely painful conference <laughs> call i was on at the time <laughs> yeah you gotta love a job where you can like watch youtube video or not even youtube streams while you're dealing with those well it so helps there were multiple of, monitors help <laughs> there you go multiple monitors there were a total of three games i unboxed so up first was one i can't talk about but it's one you'll expect to see a review of probably mid-june uh though the people who did join on the stream did get a sneak peek so shh, no spoilers this one's already prepped and ready up on YouTube, but you have to wait. Rules is rules, folks. <laughs> After that was the Gentis Deluxified Edition from Tasty Minstrel Games, a hot off Kickstarter. I gotta say, the components in Gentis were over the top. Like, I am really impressed by what I saw opening up that one, despite the fact it had stickers. Deluxe is right. From the fantastic metal money to the included third-party organizer... Uh, nice wood pieces for everything. It was a superb looking product. Yeah, really nice. I'm hoping the game plays like half as good as it looks because I'd be happy at that point. Now, the last one was kind of funny because it was a surprise to me completely. I had no idea what I was opening up at the start of the video. I didn't even know if it was a game. Like I literally had no clue based on the, we were like Googling the name of the company. It said it was shipped from, they didn't exist. I'm like, I don't know. I think Sean was worried I was going to get some like white powder in a package or something. Uh, but it did end up being a game. It was an RPG called Runaway Halflings. Hirelings. Hirelings. Like, Hirelings. Halfling. 
It's because it looks like a halfling to me. <laughs> Runaway hirelings, uh, which is all about playing a group of hirelings whose party was just wiped out by the big bad dragon or whatever. And here they are at the end of the dungeon in the treasure chamber. And they're like, oh, all our party members are dead. Uh, this one's from Thomas Novacell and looks like a lot of fun. Yeah, uh, and uh, as uh, as Angie Games pointed out, I would totally play Runaway Halflings, and so would I. That was my thought yesterday. Uh, I, you know, I don't know what it is. I think when they pitched that they were going to send this to me, I even in my head like read, yeah. and I think that's it. <laughs> So you can expect to see these unboxing videos rolled out slowly over Mondays over on YouTube at youtube.com slash tabletop bellhop, one word. So it ends up, it wasn't just me who was a little burnt out on random dungeons in Gloomhaven. So last Friday when we sat down to play, I proposed we do something different. And right away, Kat jumped at the chance. She's like, I, she didn't quite say please, but there was that whole leaned in and like, ooh, something not Gloomhaven. Now, I do think Tori really wanted to level up his character some more, but he was willing to put the game on pause. Uh, we literally did four random dungeons in a row uh, where I was basically DMing him. And I'm like, I, you know, I, I was willing to do one more, but. So there was no Gloomhaven to be watched last week. And I do apologize for the bait and switch because I wasn't sure if they were going to be okay with playing something else. And I had to set the Twitch title ahead of time. So I didn't realize till last minute that we kind of messed up there. Those auto messages from Twitch aren't always the easiest to adjust. So we did send out a note saying we were playing Gloomhaven, but mistakes happen. And it was a fun stream anyway. Yeah, actually, I got a lot of positive feedback on that one. So I do have some really good news, though. Deanna's recovery is going well, and the plan is for her to return home later this week. So we're expecting her to be feeling well enough to play some Gloomhaven. So this Friday should mean a return to the main campaign. Except there's one little hiccup. I've got to drive little G out to Point Pelee, the southernmost point in Canada, for a year-end scouts camp. And there is a good chance we may not make it back to Windsor for our usual start time. So the show is going to happen. It just might start later than usual. Now, we're aiming for a 9 p.m. Eastern start. But depending on traffic and number three, it may be a bit later than that. Uh, one thing, if we want, I suppose, I wasn't even thinking of this. I could do, I could take, start the stream and do a, do a, you know, we'll be, we'll be with you shortly. And then yeah. stop the stream and switch over to you at some point. That's at one one possibility if we uh, if if we wanted to. I Although I think before that. that we should test having two copies of Streamlabs open at once to see <laughs> <laughs> how how that works. The swap over is what I worry about. Well, I mean, I'd I'd, I'd just quit and get out, and there'd be a there'd be a short delay, but at least there'd yeah. be something on the stream. Yeah, it might not be a bad idea for the people who aren't going to hear this in time yeah. because they're not because this isn't going to come out till Tuesday and the stream's Friday. So really, this is only going to you people who are live. That yeah. are even hear if this info. even if I just you know throw the music up and I do a a, a screen saying yeah, we're running a little bad. late. We're running a little late today. You know, we'll be with you shortly with a, with oh, Gloomhaven. That is okay. a good call. Alrighty, so join us Friday, a bit later than usual, at 9 p.m. Eastern at twitch.tv slash tabletopbellhop to watch the group get back together and move on with the main campaign. We'll get to see if the experience gained during those random dungeons pays off. And now, Tabletop Gaming Weekly, where we look back and summarize what's happened since we were last here, what games hit our tabletops. Every week, we like to take a look back at the games we played, any events we attended, and other cool gaming stuff that may be going on. You can catch the blog version of This Week in Review at TabletopBellhop.com under On Our Tabletop. Now, I've got three games this week. Uh, the big one that I think most people are going to want to hear about is my first play of Teotihuacan. And, and I've really got not too much of interest. Uh, I've, I'm doing, I don't even know how many games of Jaipur a day now. Um, I, I'm, I'm not even, I'm not even logging them. I'm playing at least three, sometimes four or five uh, games a day, and it would just clog the log. So, <laughs> yeah, I know we finished up a couple games with Deanna. Deanna is now feeling better, so she's back online. So I know we played, uh, we got a, wow, we have a close game of Terra Mystica going. That one's going to be a tough fight. Um, finished up some um, Seven Wonders. Seven Wonders anymore, man. I'm starting. I, I, I'm getting worse. I think it's it's like 
I think I had a set strategy and everyone else figured out how to play. So I, just I well, that last, terrible. that last one, I came in so dead last. It actually took 15 po uh, points off my, <laughs> Ouch, my, yeah, uh, my VGA score. Uh, because I mean, I just completely forgotten what I'd been doing. It had been, it had yeah. been delayed. And I, and I just, and I honestly, I could have stopped and taken my time and looked, but I didn't. Yeah, I just like, kind eh. of, yeah, I'll just pick that. Uh, and I, I wasn't even thinking I did actually start something new. I'm now playing role for the galaxy. Um, oh. So I'm I'm learning that, and I'm actually doing uh, I think kind of well. We'll see how that ends up. We're uh, we're not done yet, but I'm uh, I'm actually in the lead on points right now. So wow. we'll see how that goes. I actually a lot of people like roll better than race. I admit I like race better, but I like both. My problem with roll is it's been so long since I played, and I don't remember the rules, which I'm, happens to me. But I'm kind of winging it. I've got I've got the rules up on one monitor, and I keep yeah. having to check on it. Because uh, I'm still not 100% sure I'm doing things right, but my I'm winning at the moment, so we'll see. <laughs> How does it work on Board Game Arena? Because I know, like, physically, you roll a bunch of dice and then you got to place them in different spots. Yeah, spot. it, does, it does a lot. Some of the placement on its own, and then it asks you to pick and, and put things oh, into... Okay. Uh, and the, the cup is weird. It's, it's, it's just kind of a, a sort of flat half a cup, and you, it shows some dots that are dice. So, yeah, that's yeah. odd. I'll I'll see how uh, how it is once I get through the first uh, one. I don't even know how long it goes. It it just it just seems it's to, similar to race. Like it's yeah. it's once the tableau gets so many things in it or so oh, many okay. victory points are gained, the the end game conditions are actually the same. It might even be the same number. It might be twelve things in your tableau. Oh okay. It's yeah. a set number, right? Or someone gets so many victory points. It's the same right. deal. What I want to check out is they put out a new board game. They put out a Race for the Galaxy board game. It just came out this year to like no fanfare. Hmm. No one's talking about it at all. And I'm really curious because it's it's like board game. There's no cards or dice. Weird. So I don't know. All right. Uh, to the games I played. So I'm going to save Teo to walk in for last because that's the one you all care about. So I got to keep you listening to the show until we get to the end, right? That's how it works. That's what we're supposed to do. Tease it. So I know everyone already checked out because they're like, Mo, you don't know what the heck a Euro game is. So speaking of Euro games, the first game I want to talk about is Strasbourg. Uh, I brought this out to the local game store and they're like, we only have an hour left. And I brought this game out and everyone looked at it and went, whoa, that's a Euro game with a bunch of auctions. There's no way we can do that in an hour. Little do they know. Uh, we played a solid five player game this Saturday at the CGA Realm. Uh, we had two brand new players and through three players who had played before, me being one of those, and two players only played once. Um, one of the things I noticed this play, because I've now played this game up, up a five times, is how easy to teach it is. Um, I've now played enough that I don't need to reference the rules, and I've got to flow down when teaching it. Um, and this was cool, because one of the players, Richard, uh, showed up to the game store the last couple weeks as someone who designed a game but had no idea what hobby board gaming was. So he's been coming back every week, and we've been showing off games to him, right? So this guy's literally new to hobby board games. All he had played is mass market games, right? Pure Ameritrash. Um, and he was able to pick up the rules for this really quickly. Like, I, he didn't ask a single question during the game. So I was really impressed by that. Well, and it, it does help that you've been playing this a lot regularly. One of the problems yeah. that I know you run into is you've got so many games and try to play so many games that if you haven't had a box open in three months, mm. it's not as easy to sit down and teach it where it, compared to if you've played it five times in the last month. Yeah, very true. Definitely. Yeah, that's the big difference is I end up teaching it and then I grab the rule book and I have to double check and see if I missed anything. That's what usually happens. Now, the other thing to note uh, from last Saturday's play that Justin, uh, who's someone new to Windsor, who's really into heavier games, didn't really like it last time we played, which I didn't know. He didn't tell me. And he was kind of like, oh, we're going to play Strasbourg. And I'm like, eh, it plays in an hour. He's like, you know what? I play every game twice because I've been proved wrong before, so I'll give it another shot. And I got to say, by the end of the game, Justin was way more a fan of Strasbourg. Um, he noted at the end, he's like, oh, I don't love it, and I don't feel the urge to rush out and buy it, but he had fun playing. And he noted that the second game was much more enjoyable, which is something... I proposed back when I first tried the game, and I'm pretty sure I mentioned on the podcast, was that Strasbourg is the kind of game that re 
rewards repeated play. Uh, it rewards system mastery. Because one of the big things in the game are the scoring cards. So I don't know if you listened to the last episode or heard last time I talked about it, but it has the ticket to ride scoring system where there's a bunch of routes. And ticket to ride is also a game like this. Once you know the routes, you know how to cut someone off or you can see what they're doing and go, oh, they're going for that. So I'm going to make sure they don't get the right trains. Strasbourg's like that. You look at it and go, there are a set of goal cards and when playing with five players, every goal card is in play. So you know if a player plays in the corner, he probably has the goal card that's played through corners. Or you see someone put out a building in the middle of the thing, you're like, oh, I bet you he's got the card that gets, I want to surround that. So this is a bigger part of the game than you would think, especially your first play, you're not going to know these cards, right? You're just going to be kind of doing things somewhat randomly. And a big part of the player interaction is this knowing the cards, right? So the player experience increase is going to make the game more competitive. Yeah, it's always interesting when you get those games where, you know, it, it's it's open knowledge, but it's only it's only open knowledge to the point where you have to remember everything. Yeah, yeah. yeah that's what we talked about uh, way earlier, right? That while there are random elements, right? Everyone, you're going to randomize those 24 cards. Knowing what those 24 cards is, is important. Now, I noted above Friday that instead of playing Gloomhaven, uh, we played something else. And what that was, was Zaya, Legends of a Drift System. Uh, we, I just basically lauded this game up above when we talked about excellent Ameritrash games. Uh, we played a three-player game. We included the Embers of a Forsaken Star expansion, which I'm going to repeat it again. If you play Zaya by Embers of a Forsaken Star, it's, it's almost required. If you can. Uh, we also use Missions and Powers. Uh, we played to 15 fame points or midnight, whatever happened first. And this time midnight came before anyone hit 15 fame. Now, I said it before, even this episode, the most important part to enjoy Zaya is embrace it for what it is. It is an experience. It's an adventure. This is not a strategic game where you can and should plan out your strategy. It's way more about dealing with how those plans go wrong than sticking with them. It's about loving the randomness and accepting the fact you're probably going to blow up once or twice and it's no big deal. Now, in this particular game, my first two turns had me blindly jumping into the sun and then next turn after I respawn, smashing into a debris field. It was not only fun to watch, but uh, and I think uh, Tori and Kat both enjoyed it. So fun to play as well. Uh, it's one of those games where anything can happen and realistically because... There is no harm in dying, yep. realistically. Um, you're better off just doing things. And, you know, man, but some of it won't work. Some of it will work. Uh, I think of it a lot like a, a video game where you just are exploring and playing. It's a sandbox. Yeah, it really is. It is a sci-fi sandbox. Uh, some other examples of some neat stuff that happened in this game. Like, the, again, the random elements, right? Is we had an event come up at the beginning of the game that, made a wormhole system throughout the entire galaxy. So all of the spawn points and almost every tile has a spawn point was connected to every other spawn point. That made this game completely different than any other game as I have ever played because man, that board was easy to traverse. It's like, oh, I want to go pick up goods. Well, I just jumped through here. Oh, I just want to go here and pick this up and I just want to go here. This is fine. Of course, then I was the lucky one, lucky one to roll a one and the wormhole collapsed on my ship blew up and got lost forever. Now, the other thing that happened, uh, which is another example of why strategy does not work in Zaya and why it's an Ameritrash game, is near the end of the game, all of a sudden, an asteroid showed up called Rikishi. There, we name things, right? It's a giant ice asteroid that literally slowly moved across the board that destroyed everything in its path. It eventually crashed into one of the planets on the board and ruined it, turning it into an ice asteroid. And interestingly, this is the spawn point for the enforcer, the cop in the game, which is one of the NPCs. And if we had blown up that NPC, they wouldn't have respawned because there was no home planet left. Uh, it's just that's the kind of thing that happens in Zaya. I'm happy to say, like Sean called it, Tori and Kat loved it. Uh, Tori really loved it. He kept going on about it. And the big thing, though, is yeah, knowing what to expect, right? Set expectations before you start playing this game. You know it's going to be that crazy and random, and a comet might just show up and ruin all your plans. If you're okay with that, you might like games like Zaya. 
Although you do have a habit of trying to Jedi mind trick people in that game, you did <laughs> it. it to, works. You did it to huge in that game, and you, while people are people are trusting of the teacher of the game, and and perhaps overly trusting of you in that game, the number of times you tell people that they should do something and they just go ahead and do it. Now, again, in this game, it's not a big deal, right? Because experimenting is part of it. It's generally not a big deal. But when you say, hey, you know what? You'll get some victory points if you come over and help me. When there's no reason in the world that person should come over and help you. And they do. Victory points. I explain the benefit they get out of it and the problem. I, I never like, oh, come help me. I'm always like, no, if you come over here, do this, you will get a fate point. Or you could go to that planet and do what you're going to do. But this is a guaranteed point. I always explain it. I explain it fully. <laughs> I give them the risk versus reward. Yeah. It just happens to benefit me more than them. <laughs> it's all about playing a character. <laughs> yeah. So once I get the video edited up a bit, you'll be able to watch Mo and Kator play through this game of Zaya over on the YouTube channel. That's youtube.com slash tabletop bellhop. Uh, even Angie Game says, hey, I'm teaching you to unfleecing. I'm like, no, I'm just <laughs> reminding you of the rules that are applicable at that time. <laughs> yeah, and, and she's yelling, trap. I wanted to yell, no, it's a trap. <laughs> They got a victory point. Come on, Cat won the game. One of those points. What's wrong? Helping me. Yeah. <sighs> so, okay. Enough about Zaya. On to the big game this week. Uh, bonus points for anyone in the chat room that can spell it. And that is Teo Tawakin. Uh, this was the demo game for the night on Saturday. And it's one I have been looking forward to trying. I've almost, like, I picked up this game. I've, like, walked towards the checkout and then put it back. Like, oh, I was so close. Um... What was interesting about this particular event is um, at the CG Realm, the person who runs the events is Ian, fantastic guy. Um, he's into lighter, party, puzzly type games. He likes quick stuff. And I don't think he realized how big and heavy a game Teotihuacan was. Uh, I think he was a bit over his head. Now, I knew this could be an issue. So to help out, I actually took the time to learn the game before showing up. I downloaded a PDF of the rules and I actually watched a couple how to play videos. So I worked with Ian to teach it. And it's one of those, I, if you ever do this, this is a, a pro tip, right? Don't just teach over the teacher, ask if it's okay, right? Like I showed up, Ian was teaching. I'm like, Ian, do you mind? I, I kind of get this, I'll explain it, right? So he was perfectly cool with that. So just don't do that. Don't just show up and the guy starts teaching like, no, no, I know this game. I'll teach it like ask, right? There, there's be polite about it. So the two of us taught it. Um, and it, it's not an easy teach. Uh, it looks really intimidating. Um, there's a lot of things to teach. And it's a lot of little procedural things that have multiple steps. Like if you do this, you also have to go up on this track, which means that this also changes. Um, it reminds me a bit of Terra Mystica that way. Because Terra Mystica, each turn, you have a choice of 11 different actions. That's a lot of actions. And you have to teach all 11 of those actions. But each individual action really isn't that complicated. And that's what Teotihuacan was like, is I can't remember the number of worker placement spots that are around the board. But whatever it is, there's you have to teach how each one works. Now, each one's not that bad, but just throwing all of that at players is a bit rough. Yeah, so BGG puts it at a uh, 3.72. So it's not super heavy but it's no, but definitely on the heavier side of things yeah especially for someone who's teaching whose favorite game is gloom yep now there is so much going on they like said all these worker spots and all these different things i'm not going to teach you here i'm not going to go through all the gameplay but i'll summarize it so the board is a giant rondel let's go back to our mechanics episode you'll know what that is but basically you go around in a circle you can't go backwards uh each turn you're going to move one of your pieces forward on that rondelle one two or three spaces so you're going to do the next action the one after that or the one after that each spot you're going to choose three things you're going to either harvest cacao or coffee or cocoa that's the currency in the game uh you're going to worship which just involves like taking these special tiles and moving up on worship tracks or you're going to do the action that's unique to that spot and each spot on the board gives you something different most of them are either getting resources or spending those resources. And that is pretty much the whole game is going and getting resources and then spending resource, getting resources from one spot and spending them on another spot. Uh, the things you're spending them for is to construct buildings, worship at the temples of three different gods. And the big thing is building this pyramid 
and decorating the pyramid. It's interesting. I, I, I'm looking at the uh, the pictures on uh, Board Game Geek, and the pyramid reminds me a lot of uh, the Mahjong solitaire game. Yeah. <laughs> the thing is, they are not at all Mahjong tiles. They look like it in the picture, and I didn't realize till I sat down, they're square. They're not oh, two okay. tiles. They're squares. So it, it looks like Mahjong in all the pictures. I honestly thought it was right. Mahjong style tiles. Um because the entire game is about building this pyramid, right? That's the thing. The building action has you place tiles on the pyramid and it builds an actual physical tiered structure, but it's not Mahjong tiles. Like I, I did, I thought they were. They're square tiles with four different symbols on them and the symbols matter for scoring points in a certain way. So what a lot of people are saying is that this is the spiritual successor to Zolkin. Now, you'll have to go back a couple episodes. I don't know the episode number on the top of my head, but I've reviewed Zolkin here, uh, a game I really enjoy. Now, I don't, I see it a little bit, but uh, you're almost going to Meritrash the Euro here because while the games may share a theme, and yes, it's the same designer, there really isn't much in common. Um, The only mechanic that is actually the same is the God Track. But even then, the importance of the God Track and how you move up on it and what you get for moving up is completely different. Overall, Teotihuacan's less tight and more forgiving because Zolkin is unforgiving. It is a, you make a wrong move, you're probably going to lose and you never have enough resources. In Teotihuacan, you can make a few mistakes and there are way more options as far as getting points. It's almost a Steffenfeld. It feels like a Steffenfeld. Uh, it's, it's a point salad. There are a lot, like, yes, building the pyramid is probably the main thing you're going to do, but you're also going to get points from doing other things. And it seems like you can actually try not building the pyramid for one or not collecting masks. Like, I'm not going to get into all the details of the things you can do for points, but I think you could literally skip one of those. Whereas in Zolkin, it's kind of important to do all the things. Now, the big thing that I think most people want to know, and it's important to me, is that Teotihuacan doesn't in any way kill or Jones theory Zolkin. To me, they're very distinct games that, despite having a similar Aztec theme or Mayan theme, I don't know. That's the other problem. Zolkin screwed up their cover and they call it the Mayan calendar and they have an Aztec sunstone on it. But whatever. Uh, That Central American, ancient Central American theme is the same, but they're completely different. Um, yeah, so it's I, they're very very similar. Uh, Ted Tawakin is right now at least trending heavier than uh, yeah. Zolkin is. See, uh, depends what you consider the weight. It's harder to teach. It's more complicated. There's more procedural steps, and if you screw them up, it can ruin the game. And it's one of those you get a lot of the oh shoot two turns ago. Remember when I did this? I forgot to move up here. Right. That part is definitely heavier. But the fact that Zolkin, so you have to plan ahead. Zolkin is all strategy and very little tactics. The whole point in Zolkin is you put your workers on a gear and you have to leave it there for so many terms before you take it off. You don't have that in Teotihuacan. It's I can move, usually have three guys on the board. So it's I can move to one of nine different spots. What spot do I need next? Oh, there's a lot of people here. So I don't want to go here yet. So I'm going to go here instead. So I think I think uh, to me, it seems like Zolkin is, you know, because you're just locked in. Right. It's that it's that whole you got to, you know, choose and die. Uh, yeah. Whereas and I'm just 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 purely looking at the boards. Um, the board of Teotihuacan is really overwhelming. Yeah. Uh, there's just so much there. Uh, whereas Zolkin is is limited and as uh, Angie Games yeah, painfully four. tight. Yeah. Um, but because it's so because it's so more narrow, it's you know if you screw up, you're done. Yeah, it's true. <laughs> but overall, like I think all of that, you shouldn't compare them. Like they're yeah. just think of them as two completely different games yep. with a similar theme. Yeah, no, there, there doesn't really seem to be any any natu- other other than the theme. They are yeah, really. They said the theme, and I got to admit, I wished I had had. I was tempted to steal my corn tokens for the one game and use it as the cocoa and just pay for everything with corn. Uh, so overall, uh, did I like it? Kind of sounds like it did, right? Well, let's put it this way. I bought it at full price. That doesn't happen. I bought it from the game store before going home Saturday night. It's back there. I don't know if you can tell. It's still in shrink. So that uh, that's a good indicator. I have bought very few games in 2019. I've been really limiting my uh, my purchases, and this is one I decided was worth spending the money on. 
So speaking of that pile of shame, this week was not a good week for the pile of shame. Not a good week at all. Um, I added three games to the list. Um, technically four if, if you count this, but I don't put RPGs on my pile of shame because if I did, that list would be possibly at a thousand games I haven't game books I haven't read. I collect RPGs. I don't collect board games. I buy the board games to play. These I like reading. Uh, so I'm not counting that. So Runaway Hirelings does not count. So we're just looking at board games. Um, so there's um, three of them there. So we have to add Teo to walk in and Gentis. And there's that other one that I'm not allowed to talk about. Now, of course, I did play Teo to walk in. So really, it's a net gain of two. So I've got us at 65 on the current pile of shame. Now, there's another one that I should be getting Saturday, so it's going to go up again, but kind of going the wrong way. Oh, well, it was bound to happen at some point. It took till May, so that's pretty far in the year. And it's mostly Kickstarter showing up. So now that we talked about what we played since the last episode, is there anything you're excited to get to play? Uh, I'd be happy to get anything onto a table at this point. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, unfortunately, you need work to settle down. The the yeah, lighting I mean, tech LARP is taking over. Yeah, no, between uh, work during the week and uh, again, you know, we well, this this last weekend weather wasn't uh, great, but this next weekend, I'm um, hoping the weather will be greater. But we've got a cubic yard of dirt to put in the backyard, so yeah. uh, <laughs> that's going to limit how much gaming time there is. Now, for me, that Twilight Imperium 4E game should be happening. It's going forward. It's currently scheduled Saturday night and uh, Sunday right now <laughs> and Sunday. Into Sunday morning. Yes. <laughs> yes. Very true. Uh, Saturday night. We're looking to start at 6 p.m. No, we're not streaming this one. Uh, that's not part of the plan. It's not my game. And there's people who will be there who are not a fan of being live on the Internet. So, no, it's not getting streamed. So you don't get to see that. But I should be playing one of the most epic games ever made this Saturday. Uh, right now we're at four players. We're looking for two more. So if you're local and you hear this before Saturday, which probably won't happen unless you're in our chat room, uh, you can join in. So we're getting near the end. This is pretty much it. Uh, we talked about pretty much what we're going to talk about. Is there anything else anyone wants to ask or has noted in the chat room? Well, I know uh, D was really commenting on the asteroid in Zaya was really amusing. Uh, <laughs> that was a fun part of the uh, the stream to watch for certain. Yeah, I got <sighs> comments from you, her, and then one person online that said that was one of the most entertaining streams to watch. So there you go. Zaya seems to stream really well. I think there was a lot of cursing and shouting and, <laughs> and getting frustrated, but not. <laughs> yep. It, it, there, was, there was a lot of laughing at what was happening. Yeah, that's the one thing about Zaya, right? I mean, there's... If you're taking it seriously, you're doing it wrong. Yeah. Yes, you're going to die. Yes, you're going to jump into the sun. Hey, look, it's Zaya. I found Zaya with my ship yes. nose first. On turn <laughs> one. Like, well, come on. That, to be fair, Huge did the exact same thing when we played. Yes. He jumped straight into, I forget, it wasn't Zaya, but it was something, you know. Hey, I'm going to go explore and I'm yes. going to start over again. I now. even took the ship that could turn the tiles when you blind jump. Like, the odds were yeah. totally in my favor that that but, did not happen. But Zaya, Zaya, there's one, nothing you can do. One tile out of that entire stack that could screw me over. And the good part about that, this is the one thing that I thought was fantastic, was that happened turn one and two, and that set the tone. Yep. Because I think if we had played for two hours and then Tori had jumped into the sun, they may not have had as much fun playing the game. Yeah. But they saw it right away, right? Like, they yep. saw how... Well, man, it, yeah, it, it helps right. that it helps that you did it too, right? It wasn't well, yes, the new yes. the new player didn't jump into the sun. The experienced player jumped into the sun and blew up. Uh, that, that's my other Jedi mind trait that doesn't work as often. Oh, come on, blind jump! The odds are pretty good. Like only one tile in that entire. St oh yeah, there is that planetary shield thing. I forgot about that. <laughs> <laughs> and now a quick shout out and a thank you to some of our Patreon backers. Their support helps make this show possible. Graham Barnett, thank you. Joe Swick, thank you. Jeff Seuss, thanks. William Fisher, thank you. Danielle Thomas, awesome to see you in the chat week after week. It's great seeing you in there. Absolutely. Well, that was the double bell. That means my shift is coming to an end, and I'm going to have to lock those front doors, punch out, get out, and hit a washroom.
Though the doors to the lobby are closed, you can always find us across the web and social media as Tabletop Bellhop, one word. You can also find us on Board Game Geek as guild number 3347. Drop by our website at tabletopbellhop.com for more gaming content. If you like the content we're providing and would like to support our continued efforts, it would be awesome if you considered tipping the bellhop at patreon.com forward slash tabletop bellhop. Remember to join us here on Twitch every Wednesday night at 9.30 p.m. Eastern and watch for the Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast to hit your podcatchers in YouTube at 2 a.m. Eastern every Tuesday. Well, that about wraps up the time we have for the show tonight. For those of you here live, thank you for joining us. Hang around and join us in the penthouse suite for the Off the Books After Show. For Tabletop Bellhop Live, I'm Sean. And I'm Mo. Thank you. And game on. Good night.